Hello, 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 and welcome to Pitch Zone, the place where we help entrepreneurs and executives level up their presentation skills. And we do that by having a casual conversation, a fireside chat of some sort, usually every week together with Nathan Gold. Nathan, how are you today? Hello. Doing great. We have a beautiful sunrise happening right here in Northern California. And as soon as we're done here, I'm going for a walk. Ah, awesome. Awesome. So I always appreciate you being here so early. It's really, really early uh, Pacific time. Uh, thank you as every You're week welcome. for welcome. making that time. And we just had a really, really fun time here leading up to the show with our guest who is an HR expert. Let's not even go, you know, into blah, blah, blah land, but immediately bring her in Minito Rizor. Minito, it is such a pleasure having you here. And as I told you, you know, we are not going to do long winded in introductions because you have so much to tell us that we want to squeeze every single minute out of our time here together. Now, Minito, our topic today is story attracts talent. You are an HR expert. Often we don't think about story and recruitment process going hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit why story and narrative is such an important component in the recruiting and in the hiring process. Absolutely. And anybody who's watching right now would tell you if they hear the word HR, they probably think of compliance, hiring, and firing. But now as um, HR evolves, we're so heavily inundated with people. That's our priority. And people matter because it starts, it shapes our organizations. It helps to support the mission that we want to bring forth in our communities. So it starts with our stories, individual stories, because most of us are looking for a place to belong. We're looking for a collective with like values and views. So if we don't understand our individual stories, it's hard to find your tribe until we really understand it starts with us and then how it connects to others. So that's why storytelling is so crucial. Mm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's that human connection. You know, we all are brought up with stories. We love stories. And I think to identify with the values and the core mission that the company has, story is really what gets us there. Now, before we dive deeper into it, Minito, we have uh, a small audience here today on YouTube. Nevertheless, we have an audience. So let's say hello to our viewers. Yash, always a great, great pleasure seeing you here, Yash. Thank you for making the time to join us here today. And then we have Scott Peak joining us from Colorado Springs. Wow, very, very nice place. Scott, very happy to have you here. I hope you're doing really, really well. All right, so the last time that I was looking for jobs and doing interviews was probably about 20 years ago. And at that time, you know, the hiring process was pretty factual. How have you seen it change over the years, Minito? And again, you know, where does story come in? We really want to distill here and help our audience not only understand the importance of story, but help them also to find the right narrative because it's a different one than when you're talking with customers or potentially even investors, right? Yes, th thank you for bringing that up because that is probably the foundation we are going on this journey. I remember when I was looking for a job, whether it's from temp agency or the newspaper, I'm aging myself, and I would read the, the article and say they're hiring for X, Y, and Z. 
We had to do research on how to prep ourselves to interview. And I always felt like I was getting a representative showing up because they would give you like these talking points to say, this is what you're going to say when they ask you this question and be prepared to work. But there was a disconnect. And now today, which I really love, especially post COVID, that people, um, especially social media, we are engaging audience constantly. We're constantly sharing our point of views, our narratives, our, our pain bodies. Um, I'm so happy that now they're even pushing more emotional intelligence because those are the things that matter. So when I'm working with organizations now, I said it's so bigger than having your vision and your mission statements on your website or um, posted on the wall when they come into a brick and mortar. They are looking for how do you show up? Do you acknowledge me? Do you see me as a human first? And what I to this organization, a lot of people um, have did this entrepreneurial mindset, mindset, regardless if you're working in a small incubator or you're working for a more conventional organization. Um, the ones that really get it right, when I talk about hiring, so now if they are going online, they want it automated. They want to feel the entire experience from the time I'm looking at videos, I want to see if it connect with who I am. Can I imagine myself in this space? So we're using more visuals to really set the tone about the human connection. And then the time I'm talking to someone and I'm having experience and sharing my true point of view of how I show up, how I do work, it's, it's reciprocal where it used to feel like very one-sided. Um, and then when I'm coming in, all the way down from the paperwork, things automated, you know, is it clear about what is expected of me? Do you see, uh, is there a potential for me to grow? So all of these things have to be embedded when we think about recruitment and retaining talent. Because if we think about it, we're all talented. We have so much to bring to the table and we're competing for people. But what is going to differentiate each organization is connect to who you are and the people that shows up and um, represent you when you're not in the room. So for the, I know it's a long-winded way of saying that, but that's the biggest shift um, of saying the biggest change. And I harp on that the most because I keep hearing, what do I have to do differently to really attract talent that's going to support me? Yeah, I mean, Nito, this goes straight back to the story. Once, once you've discovered the story for your startup or your larger corporation, how do you, how do you convey that story during every process of your HR interactions with new employees or talents that are coming in for interviews? How does how do you get that story in you know intertwined into all of those steps? And then how do you get the rest of the team in the company to use a, the same or similar type of story in the way they tell other people in their everyday life about what they do every day. So, you know, we are always sharing stories. So I'm curious about how do you how do you get that into their brains and make it so valuable that they just, hey, you haven't heard of our company? Oh, let me tell you a story. Yeah, that is a, a wonderful question. So every organization, I don't care if it's a nonprofit startup um, uh, uh, organization has been around for over 20 years, we have our annual planning right we have to develop a strategy to talk about what are our priorities for the year um ranging from our financials to marketing to people engagement um you name it and these priorities have to be in place but when we are conveying these stories what we have found in the past is that people felt disconnected because they always think about what does that mean as it relates to me so when organizations are conducting their annual planning, it is important to build in stories of how we got here. Let's talk about our mission. What are we here to do? Reminding everyone the why. Why are we, why are we even starting to market X, Y, and Z? Um, why are we well, in our nonprofit space? This is crucial because it connects again to the heart. We're stimulated like, yeah, why am I here? 
And then as we start to unpack and design what those annual priorities are, to say, look, we, last year we were here and because of all of you and the great talent that you do, we were able to achieve X, Y, and Z. Um, mm -hmm. Our vision moving forward is going to take more effort and um, from all of you. So your talent and your values matter. This way people start to connect to feel like I am integrated in the annual planning versus just the more conventional way. Like, hey, these are our priorities mm -hmm. for the year. You're going to meet with your, um, um, your manager's going to meet with your direct reports. We're going to cascade this down to performance management goals and you're going to complete goal setting. And people start to feel heavy. Like here, I, here we are again with the checkbox approach. Tell me what I need to do. Tell me what I need to improve. Tell me what I need to learn. And this is why people are always looking like, but do you really see me? But when we start to engage people from our annual planning, from the story and say, so as we share and cascade what needs to be done as it relates to each of you, we are going to be talking with our leaders for distributed leadership to talk about when you're meeting with people, this is to say, what are you working on? Um, what support do you need? What is your own career aspirations? Because sometimes I used to look at the annual priorities and I used to say, man, I would love to do training, even though I'm just doing HR recruitment. Where's the opportunity for that? Because that's where you get the best of me. That's where you get to see me shine. And I would love to impact our community if I had the opportunity to be on a platform to talk. So that's why it's important to engage about where are we going? How do we start? Mm -hmm. Who are these people mm -hmm. that say they love what we do? And then you, then you can do the mechanics of organizational goals. How do we cascade this down to departments or individuals? And therefore, when we're talking to them about their aspirations, they have a clear vision in sight and it's integrated into the organization as a whole. Yeah, what you're saying resonates so much with me because I've been as Claudio and many of us been through corporate America, corporate whatever, and we see the, the mission on the wall when you walk in and everybody ignores it. And you see the vision on the next wall and everybody ignores it. They spend $50,000 to get the words just right, but they don't yes. know why they come to work every single day. And mm -hmm. so I really appreciate what you've said here about when you know what your why is, whether it's a personal why, your department why, or your company why, the storytelling actually just amplifies that why. And that Absolutely. is to me amazing in terms of how you get everyone in the company to focus, not on the mission and the vision. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But why are we here every day? Why do we get up in the morning every day? So thank you for sharing that. And, and it reminds me of the book that came out in 2018 called Find Your Why by the Cynic Organization. And I remember specifically in there how they talked about you might have a company why and a department why, and then your own why for what why you come to work every day, but they all kind of connect. And if they don't connect, you're probably in the wrong place. Absolutely. Um, thank you for saying that because talking to organizations, when you start to get what they call disengaged employees, and especially, um, and just in all transparency, I have people that I know have been working in corporate or any position, not just corporate, who've been there for over 15 years and they're exhausted. Um, mm -hmm. They feel like the work that I'm doing, it matters more about, let me tell you what you constantly need to do better versus yeah. what have I, I, I contributed so much and it's, it's exhausting. Um, and I'm like, wow, we're humans first. And of course, we, like you said, when I go on to, in there, there's the mission and vision, but if, if you don't see me, and I'm, I'm exhausted and I'm coming to your organization. Your output is likely is not going to be manifested as what you're promoting on your portal. So if you're getting a disengaged employee and people tell me, oh, the customer service was horrible and or it's hard and no one's showing up for work or I'm having people saying that I'm, I'm, I'm I need a sabbatical because I'm tapped out. This is these are humans and these are the people we're hiring so that's why it's so crucial to say okay what are, why are we here again and why did i hire you and why thank you so much for you know wanting to show up and contribute mm -hmm. yeah so. amazing 
So the one further question I have on that is, could you share with us an example of an interview that you were doing with a very high quality or not high quality, high, top talent? Yeah. And they were on the fence. And then all of a sudden you shared a story and you knew they got off the fence and they walked out with a much different attitude. And then they got they, they, they said, oh, this is the place I want to be. Can you share a little story about that? You must have yes, hundreds. Get, oh, my gosh. Um, the ones that I'm, I believe all of you can relate to this, especially as we look at generation, generational shifts. So um, you'll hear the Gen Z as our baby boomers continue to retire out. And um, the Gen Z that's coming in and millennials. So I had a... Um, a young man who was joining and he said, look, I just got out of college. I have tons of organizations that want me and they're paying more than what this organization can offer. And I said, okay. And I said, but let's talk about what matters to you the most. And he said, what matters to me the most is that I have, I feel like I can belong. He said on college campus, I always was looking for a place of belonging. I didn't have that. He like, I moved from a different state. And I said, and what else matter? He was like, um, that you listen to my ideas and that you can at least incorporate some of them. And again, this is the entrepreneurial mindset. So when I was reflecting on the organization, that's exactly what they created. Here's a prime example of where they was able to save money. And this was helped him to say, I wanna belong here and take a, a, a pay cut. I was like, the organization, thrives on an entrepreneurial mindset. They actually look for innovative ways to continue to grow and scale. So one example was they were looking for a grant writer and they could not find a grant writer. Uh, within the organization, we took on this thing called like a gig um, entrepreneurial mindset. So the one lady was doing something totally different and she said, actually, I love writing and that's what I do on the side. So they were able to use the gig um, economy entrepreneurial mindset and allowed her on a contractual basis to write grants in addition to doing her work. So she's getting paid twice and they're not paying the amount of what a normal kind of grant writer cost because they couldn't find one. And he was so thrilled about this opportunity because of this gig economy. He was like, yeah, um, I'm applying for this, but I also do marketing. So again, within the organization, they found creative ways to save money, um, provide mm -hmm. opportunities within the organization and kind of created this entrepreneurial mindset where you're thinking outside the box. So instead of having to go and get a gig job like a Uber driver and I have to work in uh, another company, they built it in the organization and he loved that idea and he was sold. Hmm. Excellent, excellent, thank you. Well, can I be, ask you to be a little specific? So what are the key elements that make up an effective and authentic company, company story that makes it repeatable, fun to tell, and eventually becomes legendary as the company gets older and older and older? Thank you. Um, that's number one. I, that's what I'm constantly getting for organizations. What do we need to do? It has to be embedded in the culture. So once the organization priorities are set and now we are off and running, how we start our meetings um, have to be congruent or consistent when we're talking to people, not talking at them, but including them. Um, the ones that people love the, the most is to take a step back and to say, how are people doing? How are you feeling? And it sounds like, a, um, it may sound like, oh my gosh, I gotta get into feelings. No, not necessarily, but we're giving space to acknowledge humans at the table. Because when people mm. are sharing what, um, what happened or an experience they had, it, gives a, a, it actually sparks creativity because once you give me space to talk, then you're gonna get a really authentic answer. If you're looking for a cookie cutter approach or response because we have a team meeting and we need to wrap up, then you usually get people with resistance or pull back or just feeling like this is just our normal day, our Monday meetings, help me get me out of here. So um, <laughs> that's number one, embedded it in the culture how we um, practice. So instead of just doing like diversity, equity, inclusion and um, um, dashboards and all these organizational dashboards, which we need, because we need evidence of impact. But to really have conversations when you're pulling up your department goals or organizational goals to say, how are we doing? 
this is crucial to say, what is showing up for you? Do we really have those tools and resources? And someone really say, look, this is where I'm stuck or there's too many meetings or there's a lack of response. Being able to um, think of ways where we can use talent so it's not the leader having to solve every problem, but mm -hmm. whether innovative ways to say, okay, maybe we need to break off in resource groups to say, how do we get better at communication? How do we get better mm -hmm. at um, inter um, involving other people ideas to so we can help scale and grow? The expectation mm -hmm. is not that we want to take every idea, but there are so many creative innovation that's within our brains. And if you don't give me the space to do it, I'm going to take this energy and do it myself, or I'm going to go somewhere mm -hmm. else. Yeah. That's amazing. I, I, I'm immediately reminded of one of our previous guests on, an, uh, I forget the episode, we had this gentleman on named Jan Keck, and he broke my, my mind by telling me about these ice melters instead of ice breakers. And I encourage all of, all of you to take a look at what he has there because what Manito is saying here in terms of getting people to talk and getting them to feel safe and comfortable Jan has dozens of ice melting exercises that are appropriate to business. I used one last week at a workshop called the hive mind where you put one person in the middle and they say, my business challenge today is this. And then all the people around mm -hmm. just ask questions. They ask questions, questions, questions. The person doesn't respond at all. And then at the end of that 15 minutes, that person has seven new ideas to think about, questions they never thought of. So things like that you're talking about make everybody feel more bonded and together. And that, that kind of builds what you're saying. So I encourage the, the ice melters uh, can just go really far, really far. And I love that because when you were able to adopt this person's um, concept, that's a perfect example that is stuck in your head because again, you're giving me space to be able to show up and be a human first because I have something to contribute mm -hmm. uh, versus what mm -hmm. you're telling me to contribute because this is something that we do or supposed to do because everyone is doing it. I love that. Mm. Very good. Now, Minito, when you work with clients, right? You, you probably work with clients for them that is totally new territory what storytelling in the recruitment <laughs> process so how is your process of you know working with the client helping them not only understand the importance but also distill a powerful story that will help them to attract the right talent i love this claudio because when i'm talking to usually the executive leader and i said this is a safe space so tell me what's happening. No judgment. And first they were like, oh, it's the typical. We just need some HR, you know, audit handbooks. And then I'll like, I said, what's going on with your people? What's showing up? And then you could just tell them releasing the shoulders and saying, oh, we're getting feedback and it's uncomfortable. You know, um, yeah. we're doing our best. They're saying that they want this. They're saying they want money. They, um, they're saying there's some... Um, some issues with communication, and then I can see them spinning their wheels. But if you notice, I wanted to give them space to be human too. As a leader of an organization, it's expected, almost like a parent, <laughs> that you should know the answers, right? And you're supposed to be the way. But that's a lot of heaviness on any human. And if that's why I always say humans first. You just have the title to direct and give us a, a, a pathway. So once they start to share, then I say, help me understand what is, what are you trying to accomplish? What make, what does success look like for you when you go home and said, this is what we were able to do. That's a different way of saying, help me understand your priorities. Like what does success look like? What happens if we don't meet all the marks of the everyday busyness because we're disrupted, mm -hmm. but we have all these priorities that we said we wanted to do. Does that mean success for you? And when they help me understand and dissect that, and I said, that's what we need to share with the staff. They need to see you be vulnerable. They need to see that you, you don't have all the answers, but that's why you have all of you. You do. We all have answers in the room. Mm -hmm. No one's the smartest in the room because that's what's the point of having a collective of different thoughts and diversity of thought in the room. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is, it makes them like, yeah, and then I can help frame it. So when we go in and talk about annual priorities, 
It's coming from a conversation of coming together and not just saying who done what and what can you do better and this is what's happening to me, but, but more so what do we need to do to bring ideas forward in a safe place where we can move the mission forward. Mm -hmm. And then how do you get the entire organization to embrace that message and carry it forward? Because I think a lot of times in, especially in the recruiting and hiring process, you know, mm -hmm. it's not the official, you know, hey, I post an ad for a job somewhere, mm -hmm. but it's the current team members that are out there talking with their friends and so on. So they need to embrace every single person. How do you get them to do that? Absolutely. So once I had that conversation with the leader, I said, I want to be part of when you kick off this annual planning or as we wrapping up the year and the message have to be clear. What the feedback I get when I, um, I also recommend to do one on one conversations with staff. Therefore, they have a space to share um, what's going to be critical to your point before those the staff go out and start sharing their experiences, because, again, that's how we also attract or or uh, have people running from your organization they always say we always have these annual meetings but some of this stuff is a lack of follow-through or they say this thing's what's going to happen but they don't do it um, mm. they don't tell us why it's happening so when we talk about the day-to-day -day embedding this in the culture it's a reminder so we have a plan of action and we allow people from the team not just um, managers or leaders with direct reports to say, how do we ensure that all hands are on deck and we follow through with this? So one organization, we had our annual planning, they broke off in these cool committees and they allow staff members to lead that. So it gives me opportunity for professional development, it's building up my confidence, it's building up my speaking skills and it gives me ownership. So I feel like I'm contributing to the success. And guess what happened when you do that? I go out into the community and I'm gonna share this and say, what? It's happening at my job and then I'm mm -hmm. already giving you free advertisement to say maybe this is a place I want to work mm -hmm. so that's why it's crucial it's crucial I love your approach here I really really do and I'm sure our audience does as well whether you're watching us live or on replay here so I want to bring up very quickly an offer that you have made or that you're making to the viewers of this show and it's a very, very generous offer because you are, you are um, offering a free one-on-one -on -one consultation call. And I just want to quickly bring up the link uh, for you to book that. Uh, you can either scan the QR code here or there is the link below the QR code. I also put it down in the description of this video. So simply go there, click on it and book your session with Minito. You have nothing to lose and a ton to gain. Awesome. Thank Fantastic. you so much. Yeah, that, uh, I hope you all take, up, take her up on this. Uh, so Minito, I want to get back to something you said that's just so near and dear to my heart, which is when people are seen and heard, they feel like people and not just a number. So I really appreciate you calling that out. And if, if, uh, if people were able to keep that attitude as they get past the 10 mark and then the 25 people and then the 50 people, I've always noticed myself after about 100 people, it starts to become more of an execution environment, not a entrepreneurial storytelling environment. So I've personally, it's, I've always seen after about 100, I'm done, get out, go somewhere else. But one of the things one of the things I would like you to uh, validate or invalidate could be a little controversial here, but for all my life, I've always said that the one with the best story usually wins. It's not the one with the best product. It's not the one with the best service. It's not the best company. And I usually cite, uh, excuse me, Oracle as an example. Because back in the day, Oracle did not have the best product, but yet today they're the only one, pretty much the only ones around when it comes to relational databases from the old days. So they told the best story, I believe. They also beat up the competition, sent dead roses to their, you know, their 
their salespeople when they got the deal and they just they just went all out. So do you believe that the woman with the best story usually wins? And if not, it's OK. Uh, we can disagree. But I'm just curious on your thoughts. Yes, it's the one of the best, not just the best stories, but after, actually live their story, their truth. How many of us oh. have imposter syndrome? OK, so if I'm trying to fit in, oh. like I, I coach a lot of young leaders who are in trying to build up their trajectory of their own professional and they're they are struggling with imposter syndrome and a lot of unconscious bias um, and how they view themselves and how what they believe others want from them. And that impact story, because the story may not be true. So it's going to, because when the story is not true, how I behave, how I show up. So for example, um, I have a young lady who I'm coaching and she is um, Asian American. And she said, there's an expectation that I'm supposed to be the smartest one in the room. And what happened, she said she have a difficult time advocating for herself or speaking up. So when I asked, I said, okay, do you share this when you go through your one-on-ones with your manager to talk about these concerns? And she says, no, because I'm concerned that they're going to think that I can't do my job, that I'm too emotional. So just think about this. This is, it's, this is a human being coming into your space who's really smart and talented, and I am struggling at meetings to talk about ideas. If I was in my most authentic space, sharing a story just think of the creativity and the innovation to move the company forward like you talked about oracle you want to beat competition naturally so that's why it's crucial for um to us to get into talking about our vulnerabilities and saying as a leader and when you said let's stand in a room and just shoot out ideas and you listen that means i'm giving myself space to advocate for myself and not be judged if ideas sound stupid because there are no stupid ideas i may not just thought about it in a different perspective. Give me that space. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. what's going to make you have the competitive mm. edge. I, I mm -hmm. just love the whole idea of living the story and not just telling the story. That's yeah. very powerful, very powerful. How do you get people to, it, it, like this woman you just mentioned, uh, in Claudio and my consulting roles, we hear this a lot as well. Um, how do you coach that person to become a little vulnerable, but also feel safe and not feel like you're opening up your kimono and showing your scars necessarily? But there's so many different ways of, bec of being vulnerable without telling people you have, you know, uh, something on the back of your necks kind of weird thing. How do you get people to feel comfortable in being vulnerable? I love being vulnerable with an audience. If I'm going up on stage, I trip on the stairs accidentally, I'm boom, I almost fall down and everybody is like, oh, well, you okay? Yeah, I'm okay, it's no problem. I trip with cowboy boots all the time. So there's so <laughs> many ways. How do you get people to feel comfortable with being vulnerable? Yeah, I'm gonna go back to what one of the comments or questions you talked about earlier. When you say, well, so what does that look like day to day outside of those organization goals and priorities embedding this in the culture? I always go to the um, the ones who have the, the opportunity to make decisions to say it impacts our cost of productivity, engagement. If we don't allow space for uh, a safe space where we're focusing our development opportunity, not just on output, but emotional intelligence, self-awareness. So a lot of organizations are adopting um, or embedding in their professional development, organizational development, to say outside of just Strength Finder or any other assessment tool, let's hone in on self awareness. A, a, a safe small group where we have different, a variety of people sitting at the table, different titles, who are able in a safe share space with um, people who are experts. Sometimes I'll bring in a therapist. Sometimes I bring in um, leadership coaches and we talk about emotional intelligence, self-awareness and the, the consistent output is that they have a lot to unpack to give them the opportunity to become vulnerable. This is new to be able to say, I can say this in front of people in a workplace and I'm not gonna be penalized or I may not be um, uh, considered for a position because I can't handle it. So this is the safe space. So organ kudos to organizations who are adopting 
this practice in the culture because when a self-awareness is high and you teach excuse me teach one to be vulnerable therefore my self-awareness and emotional intelligence is going to be is going to increase so problem solving is going to look totally different from someone who's emotionally tapped out or drained um innovation is going to look totally different if i have high self-awareness mm-hmm. because my confidence level what i'm talking about matters to myself and i know it's going to matter to the organization because i have an environment that supports that so this is where this is why in productivity mm-hmm. your bottom line is going to be impacted you have to it's almost obsolete like when we talk about ai self-awareness is critical Gen Z's are inundated with mm. technology. So if I'm all mm. constantly in technology and I'm, I'm, I'm not skilled at having conversations, I'm not prepared with self-awareness or emotional intelligence. If I hire you with all the skills, what about the competencies to get the stuff done and connect with people? Mm. So powerful. And you just mentioned, Minito, you mentioned AI. How do you see the role of AI and how, how, do you, how do you consult your clients in using it when it comes to the hiring process overall and defining their narrative and boiling down oh. the message? Yes, thank you, because that's all integrated too. So we have all this technology, we got chat GBT and we want stuff faster. <laughs> we want information. Um, we want to automate stuff. We're trying to compete. It is constant. So from the time we are having the whole human experience, we want to spend less time with paperwork, um, documentation, um, manual labor. We just don't have the time. So automation is crucial. And especially with the human experience. So if I'm coming in as a human, I'm about to come into your organization. I want to feel like like this is evolutionary, okay, versus something that's antiquated. Um, so when people are like, okay, I'm going to post. I said, where do you post? I post on Indeed. They interview. I say, is it face-to-face? They're like, sometimes. There are some questions online. It can feel a little daunting or disconnected, but if I have some cool videos from the organization and from the people that actually work there, not stock photo, okay? (laughs) Photos of or or people interacting in the organization saying the life, the day in the life of the person that worked there. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. I wanna see what they have to say. And then if you can automate, I can do it from my phone to finish my onboarding paperwork. By the time I hit the ground running, I should have training that's set and designed just for me. And again, making me feel seen, like you're getting me prepared to, to really be integrated in this culture. That's what we want. That's why automation is crucial outside of the compliance stuff. But automation is just to keep up mm-hmm. with the productivity. Okay. And thank you, Scott. Well, well, we're I almost out of time, Manito. And I'm sorry, what? Oh, I was giving uh, Scott a shout out. He was saying another great book for self-awareness is Mindset. Yes. Oh. Thanks for catching that. So I, we're I, almost out of time, Manito. And go ahead. Yeah, we are, we, are, we are having a little bit lagging issues. I think you see it while you're watching the uh, either the live or the replay. Nathan, I think, is... Uh, Somebody standing on your internet cable or something because you are uh, not as sharp visually as you are usually, but that doesn't impact the mental sharpness at all. Uh, so yes, we are almost out of time. Nathan, try it again with your with your final question here for Minito. Okay. So if you can hear me all right, the question I have for you is that we work with startups all the time, every day around the world, and I'd love to hear from you for them. If they were to take one, two, or three steps towards finding that core story that they can use when hiring talent or attracting talent to their companies, because they're always trying to get people, what would you recommend they do to nail their story in the early stages of their business? Because many of them, they're not storytellers, but they have a story. So what would you tell them? What would you tell them to do to get started? Yes, so look at your product or service 
and say, what are you trying to accomplish? Okay, that's straightforward. Then I want you to look in within and write down your core values, what matters to you. And then I want you to also look at why, uh, what will matter to the people that we're serving. What is your why? What keeps mm -hmm. you up at night and say, how can I make this person life better? What I'm offering and shape it from there. So if your um, core values is trust and loyalty, then tell us why, why is that important? Tell us why, what happened when that wasn't shown to you? What did you do and why did, how did that impact your experience and embed that into your product or service. So for me, trust and loyalty mean everything. I remember that I was, I felt ostracized for having an opinion. I felt ostracized for being a black woman. I had these narratives and I wanted to reshape that and give people an opportunity to be seen and heard. So no matter who I'm working with, they have mm. a space to feel safe. And that's just, and then they're right there. I didn't even get to nice. the HR, right? Mm, super nice, super nice. Right. Minito, you are a really, really unique person here. And it's, it's such a great pleasure to having you here. And again, I just want to bring up the QR code and the link that you can get on Minito's calendar for a one on one coaching session. Uh, and with that, we are almost out of time, Minito, almost. So um, I want to ask you a more personal question, and that is, if you could go back in time, you just, you just mentioned a couple of you know, struggles on your path to where you are now, but today you are a very successful businesswoman and you are helping others being extremely successful with their companies as well. If you could go back, to your younger self, like, you know, 12, 13, 14 year old Minito, what would you tell her? I'm so proud of you. I'm so <laughs> proud of you. <laughs> oh. I'm so proud of you because as much as we want to say, oh, I would do something differently. No, I needed that. I needed every experience, every struggle, every suffering, because that's the totality of love. Wow. Wow. I literally got goosebumps. This is one of the best answers I've ever heard to that question, because you are where you are for a reason and you are exactly at the place that you need to be at this moment. Wow. Minito, what a powerhouse. Thank you so, so much for taking the time today, talking to our audience about the hiring process and the importance of a narrative and a good story to not only attract the right talent, but keep them because that's even more valuable than getting them in in the first place, being able to keep them around. So Minito, thank you so much. Thank you, Nathan, as well. Um, your picture is coming in and out. Uh, apologize to anybody. Uh, for the quality issues here today. And with that, I wish you all a wonderful morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world. And see you again next week. Have fun. Thank you. Bye. Bye.